as today it is third Tuesday. So we are going to, you know, uh, share a topic related to the system engineering, which is quantum computing. A lot of requests, you know, came to us that if NXP can present something on quantum computing will be helpful for us. So that's why this topic was chosen. And uh, the latest changes in the NXP Campus Connect program is this time, you know, every session is going to be hosted by one of the engineering uh, college where NXP is basically hiring students for, you know, uh, their engineering uh, talent. So I want to, you know, thank you, uh, Professor O.P. Varma, HOD EC department. Professor Neeta uh, Pandey, ma'am, uh, uh, we have a long association with her. Our lab is also, you know, uh, running an EC department. And yes, uh, all the work, you know, uh, this session is unable due to uh, Professor Dr. Sachin. So thank you, uh, uh, ma'am and sir, for giving us an opportunity to discuss and uh, share uh, DTU platform. Today we have a very, you know, stalwart very well known in the semiconductor industry, Mr. Shyam Shundar Gupta. He is visible on the screen and uh, he is senior, senior director and uh, part of NXP India senior leadership team. So I want, you know, uh, welcome Shyamji. I know uh, you are emotionally connected here, but I don't want to, you know, invest much time here. I want to pass on to you, say a few words, a brief introduction of yourself will be helpful. Uh, for the students and uh, the professors here. Over to you, Samji. Uh, thanks, Manish. Thanks for the nice introduction and welcome, you know, all the professors and uh, student community. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's it's always glad to connect back to your alma mater. Uh, so just to give you, you know, I mean, some brief uh, history about myself. So I graduated, you know, from uh, uh, DTU at that point of time. It was Delhi College of Engineering in uh, 1995. And uh, we were at uh, Kashmir Gate campus, you know, I mean, at, uh, at that point of time. So I did my B.Tech in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, Professor C.L. Madhva was our HOD at that point of time. And, uh, you know, I will always remain grateful to, uh, to uh, Delhi College of Engineering uh, in terms of, you know, the environment it, pro it provided and the strong concepts and fundamentals, you know, I mean, which were built. Uh, during the college days, which are which are helpful, you know, even to uh, till today. And uh, along with the studies, of course, a lot of fun moments. I mean, uh, when Manish talked to me today morning, you know, that uh, we are hosting this session with DTU. So, I mean, all the memories, you know, with the campus were uh, just coming live in front yeah, of my eyes. Uh, uh, I remember in uh, yeah. Kashmir Gate uh, at that time, uh, we used to attend classes, yeah. you know, and... Uh, uh, as many number of monkeys used to be in the class as a students, you know, I mean, because Hanuman Temple is so close to, to Kashmiri Gate. Uh, uh, and also, you know, I mean, along with a lot of uh, study, we still remember fun moments going to uh, Red Cinema, you know, I mean, Kashmiri Gate for the movies and and many, many other uh, places, places nearby, right? So, oh, uh, so guys, it's, uh, it's really nice connecting back to you guys. So I'm uh, in the industry for 27 plus years now. And uh, uh, working as a senior director uh, in SOC implementation with the uh, NXP. So my journey started with one of the company where I was hired, you know, from campus, uh, like you guys, uh, uh, you know, Duet Technologies. And then um, I spent some time with Philips, Philips Semiconductors and then Motorola uh, NXP and uh, uh, Motorola Freescale and then NXP. So basically, uh, 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 it feels so good to interact with all of you guys. I mean, uh, uh, just to uh, put the things in perspective, uh, my uh, my son is of your age. I mean, the students who are joining here, and uh, he is completing third year computer science from Triple IT Delhi as 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 we speak. Uh, so so it's really nice connecting back to you guys and uh, NXP. Uh, no doubt, you know, Ahmed is an, is an uh, uh, big uh, name known in the in the field of uh, VLSI and uh, doing great products in uh, automotive, industrial, IoT, and mobile. So, uh, and also, you know, I mean, uh, we have been uh, coming to DTU campus uh, for many years now. So it has been uh, the place, you know, uh, where we hire a lot of young engineers and, and, and many of those engineers are, are uh, making us feel proud, you know, but uh, with a lot of good work, you know, they have been doing, doing it at NXP. Uh, so there is some noise in the background. Uh, 
uh, okay, anyways, I, I keep going. Uh, Basim, uh, can you control that? Port Dukta, Koklaeto, Tapeto, Taika Hote. Is there some cross connection? Uh, uh, okay, uh, now it's better. So, uh, uh, so basically, yeah, I mean, we have been coming to, uh, 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 to DTU for a long time now, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the engineers who are joining from DTU uh, uh, have been uh, uh, doing a lot of good work at NXP and, uh, uh, and making us proud year after year. Uh, uh, and uh, NXP is uh, putting a, a great amount of effort connecting with the, uh, connecting with the universities uh, 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 through this series of Campus Connect programs. In fact, I remember uh, the first Campus Connect program happened on October, 20, uh, October 6, 2020, and I was hosting the first session, you know, I mean, on, on SOC design flow. So, uh, so it, it, it's, it's really nice, you know, I mean, uh, giving some, uh, something back to the community. Uh, uh, you know, which helped you shape the shape of your career, right? So, so without taking uh, much time, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, happy learning, uh, make full use of uh, uh, these deep technical topics, uh, you know, which are conducted by NXP and uh, we have been uh, receiving a lot of good reviews, you know, all around. And uh, that kind of helps motivates us, motivates us as well, you know, I mean, uh, in delivering such quality sessions now and in, and in future as well. So any, any question you guys have from me, uh, please feel free. Otherwise, you know, I'll uh, I just hand it over to Neeraj Agarwal, uh, who is our uh, presenter on quantum com computing. You know, which is which is such such a niche topic. You know, I'm in in the industry today. Yeah, Shamji. Uh, before that, uh, uh, HOD sir is also visible. So I want few words uh, from HOD sir, and if ma'am is also there, after then you know few words from the ma'am also. Neeta sure. Sure. First, let yes, me. Sir. Let me congratulate uh, the Department of EC to have uh, the tasks. Uh, the, the, uh, they have a, a lecture on the quantum computing. Normally, we think about that the quantum computing is a field in which only the computer science students are dealing with. And I have, uh, I'm happy to know that you are dealing with the VLSI also. And this master's program, we have a master's program in which uh, around 20, 24 students from the VLSI background are sitting here. So I most welcome all, uh, uh, especially our alumni, Sushyam uh, Chandar uh, Guptaji, and uh, Mr. Neeraj and uh, Mr. Uh, Manish. And you are talking about the monkey. They are not leaving the DC. They are available in DTU now also. Oh, okay. <laughs> Every day you can see it. They're taking something from a hand of a person who is moving around in front of the EC campus, <laughs> EC department campus also. So. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see you when you're visiting this institute uh, sure. uh, uh, yeah. ne next time. Because, because let, initially the electrical department uh, and electronics department were together, then we came out from the electrical right. departments and separated. And we, I also worked with the CL Vado, sir, uh, also for a small period of the time. In fact, I joined in 1998 when you pass out. Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, sure. You sure. pass out. So hopefully we'll find that you, this particular session, especially based on the quantum computing, will be very useful for all of the uh, all of us, especially for my PhD MTEC uh, students as well as my faculty members. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Nita, ma'am, is there? Uh, yeah, thank you, Manish. Actually, yeah, Nita, ma'am, thank you first yeah, of all, yeah. you know, for yeah, giving yeah, us this yeah. opportunity, and uh, we have to, you know, strong our relationship, and uh, very soon we'll upgrade our lab. Over yes, to you, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Manish, and uh, thank you, Gupta ji. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for, for all department members. Actually, I'm running uh, fever, so I, I couldn't oh. join in person. So no, this no. is very nice initiative and the quantum computing is actually it is uh, the buzz thing these days. So it will be very useful that our students will be knowing about this and uh, maybe they will be doing some projects based on it. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Aji, thank you, thank you ma'am. Take care and you know, get well soon. Okay, thank you, sir. Now, you know, uh, Neeraj Agarwal, which is, you know, visible on the screen, he is our today's presenter. He is having 20 plus years of industry experience and uh, he did a lot of research on quantum computing. Uh, he did his master's in quantum computing from uh, IITs. So, Neeraj, uh, over to you. Maybe a brief intro before, you know, jumping on to the real topic. 
we are very excited to learn about uh, quantum computing which is very new yeah yes, sure uh, over to you neeraj sure manish thank you thank you manish thank, thank you thank Shamji. you thank you faculty so good Thank evening uh, professors and uh, dear students and my colleagues so i am neeraj and i have uh, more than 20 plus of years of experience and mostly it is in embedded software on various products like uh, iot smart meters and consumer electronics and now currently i am part of a uh, software for where in the uh, india development center at nxp now Now let me just begin now. So, just a minute. Yeah. So I'm beginning with this uh, maze uh, uh, automation, which shows that quantum parallelism is something which we are aspiring for, and which is uh, uh, which is which means that uh, this uh, inherent parallelism is providing you. Uh, the solution uh, to explore all the solutions at the same time instead of uh, as 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 we compare with the classical computation but before we reach uh, at that point we just need to see what computation what classical computation means and where we are so you all know that uh, we are uh, we know there is a little switch which is which we call as transistor and that is that if you apply a voltage at the base you have a flow of electrons in uh, from uh, emitter to a collector right and this is how we uh, we have a logic classical logic which is boolean logic but before before reaching there uh, at this point where we have began so we began with at a, at a point where we started learning physics of material right so we studied material we studied we studied that uh, if uh, there are uh, dense atoms then then they have valence and conduction bands then we studied that the, uh, the intrinsic uh, band gap semiconductors right and then we studied that uh, we by introducing impurities we can have certain uh, uh, properties of certain uh, 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 uh silicon and germanium are the uh, material which we can use for this kind of purpose right and that's how we build this uh, transistor before that we studied the transistor characteristics and all right we know that if you put those uh, transistors two transistors into a uh, uh, series we create an and gate with this uh, truth table of it and we uh if we put that in parallel we have a truth table of uh, uh, a or gate and then we devised a universal gate from that which is the and gate because it is suitable for uh, uh dealing with a single universal gate right so uh, i'm giving you this uh, analogy because the very idea that uh, uh, how physics is used as uh, for computation that actually surprises few of the people who don't know about quantum computing now so i i need to begin with some basic fundamentals of uh, quantum mechanics of course i am not a physicist i am an engineer so i am not going to discuss the particle in a well or uh, black body radiations or something of that sort but i would do some uh, fundamentals which are essential and just sufficient for the uh for understanding how quantum computation works okay so with that we have these three tools which we call superposition entanglement and interference so these are the three tools which makes a framework for us uh, and tools for us which uh, makes quantum computing possible so if you see the diagram on right hand side of uh, uh, there is a stair and there is a slide right so the basic difference if you remember between classical and uh, uh, quantum physics is that quantum physics are uh, is these steps right anything we measure any measurable we have we have this in terms of certain steps certain states it the quantum computing is not like classical it is not at all continuous so we'll learn more about what is what i'm talking about the uh, it's uh, what is continuous and what is the uh, not non continuous things 
So we know what is a particle. So we particle have uh, particles are discrete, discrete. They bounce off when they collide with each other and they have a precise positions, right? On the other hand, we recognize a uh, wave with a wavelength and a frequency. And the wavelength waves are supposed to be continuous and have uh, interference when they collide. And you know that uh, if they are in phase, they, they can do a constructive interference, which amplifies the waves, resultant waves. And if we have destructive interference, if they are completely out of phase, right? And that's how our noise cancellation in our uh, headphones work on this destructive interference principle. So how do we know light as a wave? So we know light as a wave that uh, we can just do a simple experiment if uh, we pass light through a double slit, a double slit, uh, we have interference uh, patterns we call fringes. If you can see on the right hand side, this is the kind of interference pattern, and that is because of uh, because the light uh, shows a wave behavior, and we have uh, constructive and destructive interferences giving us this kind of uh, pattern, right? But uh, can light be a particle also? So we know all uh, all of know that uh, uh, we have learned photoelectric effect, right? And uh, this is the effect. Um, I mean, this is the this is something for which Einstein got uh, its reason Nobel. So what is the photo photoelectric uh, effect experiment Einstein uh, did? Uh, so he used a gold plate and he started uh, throwing light on that gold plate. Now he started with the infrared light, which is supposed to carry a lot of energy, but the, there, there were no electrons knocked out from the gold plate. But on the other hand, if uh, a, the ultraviolet light, which has a very high frequency, if he is projecting, if he has thrown that on the gold plate, the electrons were coming out. Now the thing is that, uh, how much, uh, however large energy and for whatever large duration uh, the infrared light was thrown on the gold plate, there was no uh, electrons knocked out. So he proposed a theory that uh, light is showing a uh, particle-like behavior and he called those energy particles as quantas or uh, photons. So for example, if you want to knock out a electron from this gold plate, let's say there is a five unit of uh, energy required to knock out that plate, that uh, electron. And if you are giving an energy, which is two or three elect, uh, uh, units of energy, then the, the electron is not going to be out, right? So you need exactly five uh, unit of energy in that uh, photon. So this particle behavior, and uh, he compared that uh, behavior with the um, uh, bowling pins experiment that you just, if you're just throwing small ping pong balls on the bowling pill, pins, there is no effect, but the bowling pins are not, not, not going to be bowed down. But then if you use a uh, larger ball, which has a larger, larger energy and momentum, then uh, it, it will knock out, knock out all the bowling pins. So this is, uh, so this established that uh, the light can behave as particle also. So this is the beginning that people uh, try to understand that uh, uh, matter uh, has a particle-like and wave-like pro properties. Now, going ahead, um, are particles be, uh, do do particles behave as waves also? So again, we did a uh, double slit experiment and an electron beam was used to see what happens through this double slit. Now, it was expected that the there would be two such lines as as, I, as you can I, you can see. Less. So the, the expectation was that on the screen you would see this kind of uh, pattern because. Uh, the there, there there is not a, no expectation of any kind of interference right because it these are particles but to our surprise there was an interference pattern which appeared so it was established that at certain point of time these electrons also behave as a wave so uh, there is a and and if you can see there is a high intensity in the middle 
the lower int intensity is on the side. So the um, constructive and destructive interference patterns are established here. So it, it's a, it's like it's a particle showing an electron behavior. So and uh, this uh, this is called uh, in principle a uh, wave and particle duality, right? So we'll see more on this, but then uh, the question comes where then when, when all the particles have a wavelength, then why we uh, don't have a wave like characteristics? Because in the macro world, if you see the 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 wavelength, uh, the matter wavelength, which we are talking about is completely dependent on the Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So um, if you see the Planck's constant is of the order of 10 to the power minus 30 right and if we see the momentum here and at the, at the denominator it is mass into velocity so our masses are too high right but as compared to the electronic uh, microscopic objects they have a very less amount of, of mass in that case this is this wavelength is observable in this in that sense but in, for the macro objects this wavelength is not um, visible now uh, how this wave like behavior can be uh, uh, described? What is the uh, equation which describes it? So we call it as a wave function, which uh, which is dependent on the position and time, right? And uh, you can see that uh, for the elect same electrons, you have this electron cloud, the probability cloud, uh, because uh, from the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if you remember that. Uh, the position and momentum of uh, uh, electrons or any uh, macroscopic object uh, which behaves quantum mechanically, you cannot uh, determine that. So what you can determine through this wave function is the probability cloud of that microscope, microscopic object. So, we'll so how it is related to the quantum computing? The qubits, which I will define later on, what is qubit? So it is quantum bit as compared to the classical bit, and it behaves like a wave also at certain point of time, right? And the superposition states of the qubit can interfere with each other. So when this qubit, which is a particle, it is put into superposition, it behaves as it, it interferes and it behaves like a wave. Now, using interference, we can amplify the probability of the correct answer. This is this is the most important thing which we are going to see how we can get an answer because of the properties of the uh, superposition and interference, right? Going ahead. Now, what is the? Uh, yeah, so there is one more term I need to define is uh, the Hamiltonian of a uh, wave function. So this wave function, um, this wave function psi, usually we represent this uh, wave function as psi. The Hamiltonian is an operator which operates on this wave function psi and it gives you the energy of that uh, particle or uh, um, uh, quantum particle. Yeah. So why we're talking about uh, energy is because this is an important concept uh, if you see this equation, which I've just given to you, this is uh, this would look similar to uh, something which you may have uh, seen in your linear algebra course, right? So when you apply this Hamiltonian operator on this uh, wave function, what you get is the energy. But this energy, uh, as I just said, that uh, it is unlike classical uh, uh, classical mechanics that this energy is not in a continuous form. It has certain values, allowable values corresponding to the uh, certain states of the wave function. So this energy E uh, is basically giving you a eigenvalue of this eigenstate, right? So in terms of uh, mathematical operators, you can see if you apply a uh, operator on a vector, what you are getting is if, if you are getting a lambda value, which is a uh, which is not a vector, right, with the same vector coming back, 
then you say that uh, this lambda is a uh, eigenvalue, right? And I know, I mean, as a student, you must have gone through linear algebra course also. Um, you know how to calculate an eigenvalue, right? So this is the, uh, so this energy uh, and Hamiltonian mention was there to make you aware that any, any observable in the uh, quantum domain uh, is giving is, is given to you in the terms of eigenvalues only. Now in classical energy equation, we have total energy as uh, kinetic and potential energy. And similar uh, things is observed in the uh, uh, quantum uh, domain also. So we have this uh, uh, energy equation as uh, this uh, cross uh, uh, this uh, uh, Planck's constant square divided by 2m, and uh, this is this is this is denoting is the kinetic energy of the electron that how fast this electron is rotating around the nucleus. But this uh, part is the potential energy because of the Coulombic interactions with the nucleus. And uh, we have um, a, a general equation which describes the evolution of the uh, of this uh, quantum um, wave function, which is uh, very famous and it is called as a Stroessinger equation. So Stroessinger derived this equation to define that how this wave function is changing the evolution is happening with respect to time so this this is a this is i this is planck's constant and this is del by del t is giving you the rate of change of psi with respect to time right and that is equivalent to this hamiltonian uh, multiplied by the state okay now this equation uh, if you if you try to derive what are the solution to this equation. So, so the solution of this equation basically are going to give you the states in which this wave function could be find out if, if you measure that, right? But it is difficult to operate because you need to create, uh, you, you need to uh, do some uh, like uh, derivation and derivative and integration to solve those. But then you have other means of uh, getting the and the eigenstates of this equation, right? What are the other means? Uh, I mean to say is that this Hamiltonian operator, and in fact every operator on a wave function, can be represented in terms of a matrix. Okay, and uh, there is another form um, which is called Dirac notation, which is uh, helpful in writing the large matrix. Uh, form of the equations into the smaller equations. So we'll see that uh, what what it is going to give, what it looks like, right? So this uh, Stoginger's equation also tells us about how our quantum hardware should behave and how to operate over that, right? Now there are some quantum postulates that if a quantum state is represented by, a, a quantum state basically is represented by a vector uh, cat, we call that cat. So this 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 is the kind of uh, um, uh, representation, and this is called Dirac representation. So in this Dirac representation, you are representing this state, and uh, this is called cat. So the dual of it is called is a bra, and uh, so it is uh, psi, and uh, this uh, bracket would be in the opposite uh, direction. For to represent that uh, dual, which is called a bra, and this state is represented basically in a state space, which is called a Hilbert space. Now, what is Hilbert state uh, space? Is Hilbert state? Uh, as I said, that this wave function uh, can attain a uh, few defined state, which we are calling as uh, eigen state also. Now, these eigen states, uh, if we combine them, we um, um the combination linear combination of all these states makes a hilbert space so hilbert space basically a vector space so if let's say i have four um, eigen states achievable the linear combination of those four states is making my hilbert space right so i would measure my uh, uh, wave function in that hilbert space only 
and uh, similar to the classical uh, observables like if i'm running uh, i can uh, in in classical uh, physics i can uh, get a speed direction position and energy and momentum so i can have a momentum operator and energy operator and position operator from that uh, same schrodinger equation but usually we don't use schrodinger equation uh, for uh, calculation purposes it is the matrix notation and um, dirac notation which we basically use so if i let's say want a kinetic energy to be calculated i would have a kinetic energy operator which would uh, operate on this uh, state uh, this uh, wave function psi now we have some uh, predefined uh, uh, observables we call as uh, um so we have this uh, matrix uh, this operator is called a z operator uh, these are these are basically poly uh, matrices and uh, these are this this will form our gate uh, gate operations which we are going to do for uh, calculations okay so this uh, operator z has a matrix like this okay and uh, similarly x has this uh, uh, matrix and y has this i will explain more on these gates uh, what they do so they are mentioned here just to mean, just to say that uh, uh, each observable need to be represented in the form of a matrix and there are certain properties for this matrix which they need to uh, follow otherwise they are not recognized as a uh, proper observable now the measurement of the measurement of the observable with an operator a will only ever be an eigen value so this i have already specified that if you are operating through an operator a which could be any of these matrices or any other operator also then the resultant would, would be an uh, eigen value always okay so if you see uh, the, these are the poly matrices we have defined which we use at a, as as gates also and for the quantum computation um, you can see the corresponding eigen values so for the z uh, gate we have uh, eigen values as 1 and minus 1 with corresponding eigen state as 1 uh, 0 and 0 1 okay so i will explain what is this eigen state and uh, what is the meaning of 1 0 and 0 1 here and uh, then the last one i think is last postulate which is of uh, importance to us is that whenever you have a uh, observable with operator a and it is operating on the state psi then the probability that you will observe a eigen value a is actually given by the inner product of this uh, ai value with respect to the the uh, this uh, wave function psi and modulus uh, square of that uh, modulus so i will exp explain it later on so with this uh, information a uh, little information about uh, quantum computing postulates uh, we need to know what is the quantum uh, representation of information so in classical you have uh, bits 0 uh, and 1 only so there is no special representation required the only thing we do is a uh, higher abstraction of data like um, hexadecimal or octadecimal or bcd codes right so in that uh, form we represent uh, to make our life life easy because uh, we cannot just to keep on doing uh, calculation in binary but what is the quantum representation of information that let's just see that so we have classical bits which we say the low charge and high charge states but in qubits uh, we can say that uh, the a state is 0 and 1 right but then the state could be in any proportion of 0 and 1 also what is that proportion uh, that we'll see so we call that uh, uh, state of uh, superposition because uh, it's a mix of 0 uh, and 1 in any proportion uh, we call that superposition then if you make a measurement of these qubits the qubits actually is going to 
collapse to either zero or one. So it's like uh, throwing a coin. Um, so you have a coin, it has a head and tail, and you, then you just start, you just start rotating it, right? So when it is rotating, you can say that it, it is in superposition. It is neither in zero and one. But as soon as you measure that, that means you stop the coin. It would give you either hide, head or tail, right? So that's similar thing. Uh, that's analogy you can just remember. Now, four classical bits you can have with uh, you with four classical qubits you can have two to the power four different configurations at a time, right? So you have these these configurations at a time, but what is the information they carry? So at time t, only one piece of information you can have from these four qubits. But because of superposition, if you see in the quantum world, these four these four are qubits. So you you have a superposition of the qubits. You can say that 16 uh, combinations or 16 uh, piece of information you can have in one um, at at one single point of time. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I talked about measurement and uh, superposition, but an interference also, but there is one another property which is of very much important importance which is called entanglement so entanglement is a property between two uh, micro particles or quantum particles that uh, which is having a high degree of uh, correlations and what is what do what what do i mean by that correlation is that however long separation they have in between maybe light years there is that correlation still exists so if you I have um, one qubit measured at one end as one. The other qubit you uh, at at maybe the uh, moon, uh, you will you can just predict it will be one or zero. So that kind of correlation and that forms basis of uh, many uh, different things like um, uh, quantum communicate uh, quantum communication and quantum cryptography. This forms the basis. Okay. So, and we are going to use this use this for uh, quantum calculation also. Uh, I will highlight where the use of entanglement is happening. Okay. Now, classically, we have logical gates, and uh, the quantum gate are slightly different. So, what actually a quantum gate is that you are representing the information as a vector. The quantum information as a vector, and uh, so qubit is a is a vector. Okay, qubit is a vector, uh, but but just two state vector. So we have a two state vector, and you throw it uh, through a quantum gate, and that quantum gate modifies it in the sense that it rotates the vector. So every operation on the state of a uh, uh, state of a qubit is actually a rotation operation. So uh, this this is called a quantum gate. So the quantum gate operation is a rotation of the vector. Now, what is a qubit? So uh, all the information which I have given that uh, a particle exists in two states and then we have a superposition to represent uh, what actually we want. We want a two 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 level system. We want a two level system because we just want to deal with the binary data. As uh, classically, also we are habitual of dealing with the two qubit uh, two state uh, objects, right? Although we can do it uh, uh, in three states also, but uh, that would have become too complex for us. So now, typical uh, uh, qubit state psi is written as a combination of its two eigenvectors, right? So there is a state of zero, there is a state of one, and these two are the eigenvectors of a quantum state. And this uh, quantum system is a two level quantum system only, okay? And this, these two states have their amplitudes, which are represented by alpha and beta. Now, you just note that this alpha beta are complex values. So uh, A plus uh, IB or something like that, right? And uh, 
the probability, uh, as I said, that a wave function when it is into superposition, you cannot just uh, uh, find its uh, position, right, or momentum, but you can talk about its uh, probability or uh, uh, probability of its position, right? And uh, what is that probability is that you do a square of uh, amplitudes of the individual um, uh, eigenvectors that would give you a probability of um, uh, that uh, particle to be in, right? So if you see the combined probability, obviously it should be one, right? The particle would exist uh, anywhere uh, in the space, right? So the total probability of a uh, quantum qubit should be one, right? That means that uh, this alpha square plus beta square should be equal to one. Now, what is that? Uh, so I'm talking about here a equal superposition. Uh, so I'm mentioning it equal superposition because the gate which we have, we just put the qubit into equal superposition. We are not doing any um, uh, other uh, operation. I mean, there could be other ratio also of the different amplitudes of the of the uh, eigenstates but we use gate which puts the qubit into equal superposition so when i say equal superposition in that case the value of alpha would be 1 by root 2 and the value of beta would be 1 by root 2 so that the total probability if you see the alpha square would be half and beta square would also be a half and total makes a uh, makes a one right now Having said that, that this uh, this is the state uh, representation of a qubit and uh, having complex uh, amplitude values, we need to check the state. Uh, we need to represent the state of individual qubits, right? The whole quantum computation system would consist of many qubits, but then the, this quantum system should have something to represent the state of a qubit. So what is that? OK, sorry, I need to mention this first. OK, OK, so multi qubit interactions, right? So we have one qubit as psi, psi one and one qubit as psi two. So we, we would call as a two qubit computation system. So what would be the state of this qubit, two qubit system? The state would be always be a tensor product of the two qubits. So psi one tensored with psi two, that is, uh, uh, alpha 1 cat 0 plus beta 1 cat 1 is tensored with this one. This gives you the complete state of the system, right? Now we have uh, new, so the, the so the combined state psi would be alpha 0 0 cat 0 0 plus alpha 0 1 cat 0 1 like that. Now this, uh, this is a two qubit computation system. So instead of two, now we have four possible eigen states right and this state of psi can now be represented as a vector which is alpha 0 0 alpha 0 1 alpha 1 0 and alpha 1 1 so what is this alpha 0 0 representing so this vector represents that this alpha 0 0 is going to give you the uh, proportion of first eigen state of this Two qubit system. This alpha zero is zero one is going to give you the the proportion of second eigen state of this two qubit system like that. So every vector, if you see like this representing a state of psi, it means these coefficients are giving you the value of the corresponding eigen state vectors. Okay. Now we talked about. Uh, uh, entanglement just before. This uh, state psi I uh, represented um, is it just interaction of two qubits. There is nothing uh, sort of any entanglement between them. So the uh, correlation in, in, the, in terms of entanglement which I was talking about, it's not there, right? So if you see, uh, if you see the, I represent the qubit as a uh, circle and a square, then uh, the the total combination of uh, this, which uh, which is uh, a tensor product of uh, all such uh, the, the, 
all the uh, eigenstates of this uh, uh, psi one and psi two is going to be, give you equal proportions of all the eigenstates, right? Possible eigenstates. But in terms of if this is an entanglement case, you will just get 50-50% of only two states. The other com components of the uh, possible state vectors would not be there. So just remember that we'll, we are going to use that uh, soon. Now, as I was talking about uh, representation of the information, so we have this vector, right, which we have just seen here. So we have this vector and a qubit as a two state vector. So I represent a cat zero as a one zero column vector and a cat one as a zero one column vector. So how do we represent the state of this qubit? OK, and before that I mentioned that these alpha and beta, these are complex numbers, right? So for a complex number, if you see uh, there are two portions here, alpha with alpha right so it could be it would be something like uh, uh, x plus ij right so you need two numbers here and two two numbers here so you need you need four degree of freedom to represent this bit uh, this uh, single qubit of information but we devise a uh, something geographic uh, geometrically uh, which we call as a block sphere to represent the state of this uh, single qubit and uh, we just need two degrees of freedom on this sphere because one degree of freedom is not required as we know um, see, see we need four degree of freedom but then we know that this alpha square plus beta square is equal to one which is total probability in in of the particle in the space right so we know a relation through which we can uh, if we know alpha we we can derive beta so we don't need, uh, so we can strike out one uh, degree of freedom, so we can live with three degree of freedom, right? But then if you see the qubit in where I can specify this uh, phase information phi and this angle theta in this block sphere, uh, and uh, I just uh, um, remove the global phase, I can live with the uh, relative phase between the uh, re relative phase uh, between this um, uh, coordinate and my vector psi. Okay, so uh, because for the calculation purpose in the quantum computing purposes, we are not uh, caring about the global phase. No, we we just need uh, this uh, azimuthal angle phi for representing the phase and this polar angle theta. So we can live with the two degrees of freedom and the, this sphere represents any point on this sphere. We can represent with the, these two degrees of freedom. And in that uh, we define, uh, we represent geographically the state of any single qubit. Now, what are the poly uh, gates which we have seen? So there are some basic gates which uh, you can just compare with the um, classical gates. So I have this not gate X, which has this matrix. Um, matrix, if you remember from the postulate we have defined that every operation is a can be represented in terms of a matrix. So this is an observable. Um, and if it operates on this uh, state, uh, any state L, which is represented by the coefficients of these state vectors alpha and beta, uh, it will just flip that uh, state. OK, so the coefficients are going to be flipped. So you if you pass zero, uh, it is going to give you cat one. OK, and this is the rotation around X axis. So this this is this is the representation block sphere representation, right, which I just explained. So in this block sphere uh, representation, if you see, this is the x axis which is coming outward, right? Outward to us. This represents x axis. So any rotation around this x axis from position zero, it will give you one. So this is acting as a quantum not gate. Similar to this is a phase flip gate, right? So for the phase flip gate, if I am representing this. Uh, y on the uh, uh, my right hand side um, so this 
rotation around uh, angle phi, which I've given uh, shown you. This is called a phase flip gate. The next is Y gate and Y gate is going to give you uh, a rotation around Y axis, which uh, flips your uh, phase and uh, and uh, uh, phase and uh, the value uh, bit flip. So bit flip and phase flip both uh, it is doing simultaneously. And uh, then we have spatial gate, which is a superposition uh, gate. I, uh, it is called as a Hadamard gate. Now Hadamard gate is basically a combination of two operations that it, it is uh, rotating uh, the position of the uh, qubit vector in uh, around Y axis also and around Z axis also. Now what essentially it is doing is it is putting your qubit into a superposition state as I was talking about the um, equal superposition, right? So if you see this uh, alpha with one uh, one by root alpha amplitude as one by root two and beta is also one by root two. So the if the coefficients are like that, we can say that uh, the qubit is put into the equal superposition. So this matrix operation is putting that uh, qubit into equal superposition. Equal superposition means there are equal chances that if you measure that, it can uh, be zero or the measurement result could be one or zero. OK. Then we need to come to uh, uh, two qubit gate. This is an important gate and I call it as entanglement gate. So the entanglement which we have just discussed, this this is used as C naught gate and it is required because as you see in the classical computation, what do we do when we add? So when we add one and one, the result would be zero, but then there is a carry forward. So you one one classical bit affecting the other classical bit, right? So that kind of operation is required in the uh, quantum domain also. So this is the state machine of the uh, C naught. We need to quickly see that because we are going to use it uh, at many places. So what is a C naught is that there is a control bit and there is a target bit. Now if the control bit is one, Okay, if the control bit is one, this target bit is going to be flipped. So it is a not gate, as I explained. It is a not gate which is going to flip its uh, the state of the uh, qubit which is input to it. But it will do that only if this control bit has a value of one. Okay, and similarly we have a important gate swap, but it is a derived gate. It's not a native gate, right? Native gate are those gates which are basic in nature, which uh, your quantum hardware supports uh, intrinsically. OK, this swap gate is actually made up of. Uh, three gates, three C naught gates, which you have just seen right now, if I give a. Input zero and one here, what the output of this swap gate is that it will reverse the values here. So ultimately in the end here you are going to get at this qubit you are going to get a cat one and at this point you are going to get a cat zero. OK. So. I am not going into details I wanted to explain, but for the positive of time I'm just moving ahead. Now. Uh, irreversible operation, right? So let's just see what is the what is the matrix of this X gate? And uh, when it is operated on one, what is the resultant? OK, so 0, 1, 1, 0. This is the matrix of the X, uh, X uh, not gate. And when it is operated on a cat 0, cat 0 we represent as um, 1 and 0. So if you remember what is 1, 1 is the um, uh, proportion of state vector of 0 state. OK. And zero is the proportion of uh, the second uh, higher level state uh, state of this qubit, right? Because the qubit is just having two uh, two states. Now we just do a, a, a matrix multiplication and we see that the resultant is a one. But then after getting this one, right? If we again apply this operator uh, X to it, what is what is the result that 
we get a identity matrix. Now this is a very important uh, property. This uh, such kind of operations that X multiplied with the transport of transpose of the X is giving you an identity matrix. These are such gates are called a unitary operations. Why it is important to have a unitary operations? Because quantum computing is reversible, right? And quantum computing is reversible because quantum science is reversible. Quantum mechanics is reversible. What X is giving you is one operation in time T, but then you can just see that X transpose operation if done, uh, it is giving you the same operation done, but in time T minus, okay? So it is just reversing your, uh, what, what you got out of X, it is reversing that X, uh, that uh, resultant, okay? So, and then this property uh, of the quantum gates uh, is being, is the, is the fundamental through which uh, the asymmetric uh, cryptographic operations were broken by uh, Shor's algorithm, right? So, so do remember that uh, this reversibility is called a unitary operation. Now with the basic principles of designing the quantum gates, we have P uh, thumb rule one that you can't copy the quantum state, the no, clone, no cloning theorem, as soon as you are going to copy, it is going to collapse, right? Because a measurement is going to collapse the superposition into either zero and one, right? And then, uh, the next thumb rule is quantum operations are linear. So you must be, so must the gate operations be. So quantum mechanics is linear um, as it could be represented uh, through uh, vectors and matrices and uh, linear algebra is the rule which we are, uh, which we use in quantum mechanics, uh, quantum computation. So instead of a Boolean operations uh, in classical zeros and ones, we do linear operations through the linear algebra. So linear, so our computation logic is linear algebraic. Okay. Now the quantum operations are probabilistic and not deterministic. So I will show you how it is uh, probabilistic because uh, once you are throwing qubits into superposition, it is just equivalent to say that you have given all the inputs at the same time, and the same circuit is being uh, evaluated for all the inputs at the same time. But then what you get at the end is you get your result uh, probability of uh, the right answer, but there would be slight uh, other probabilities of the wrong answers also because of uh, noise in the quantum systems. I will talk about noise also. But the quantum operations and circuits are reversible, which we have just seen because uh, all operations are supposed to be unitary matrix. And we have to make it right. So if you design your gate, next gate, then you need to check that uh, this operation is unitary or not. Otherwise, it is not going to give you the intended uh, thing. Now, the quantum circuits are acyclic and not cyclic because uh, there are no control operations al allowed. So no while loop, if loop, right? So because the qubits are put into superposition and this uh, whole calculation need to be done in one shot only, okay? Now, how we, what are the quantum algorithms and how the job is being submitted? Let's go through that quickly. Okay, so this is a program. Uh, this is this is a explanation how uh, you can submit your job. So if you, I hope it is visible. Um, so you have a classical desktop computer, okay? Now you have some Python, PyQuil kind of high level language as we do make our programs in high level languages. You just write your quantum program. Now that quantum program is going to a control computer. So usually it is a cloud infrastructure. Now that cloud infrastructure is having a quantum compiler. Now the, there are a lot of things which a quantum compiler do because it, uh, before it submits the, your job to a uh, quantum processor. So I'm calling it as a QPU here, okay? Now what are the things a quantum uh, compiler need to do? Obviously optimization, right? 
so you have studied that with the basic gates you initially started with k map uh, optimization right you know you used to make k maps but now i mean over the years we have sophisticated tools to optimize the gates right so if you you can see that uh, there is a z operation if uh, there is a h operation z operation h operation then you can just replace it with a not gate so such kind of uh, optimizations are possible so what it does is it takes your program breaks it into uh, the native gate it supports and then it sees uh, that uh, what what kind of optimizations it can give then there are other considerations other consideration involves that uh, for certain operation uh, and uh, this operation is actually c not gate right you saw c not gate there is a control bit there is a target bit right it is two qubit gate now for that you need a connectivity among those qubits physical connectivity because entanglement you you reproduce the entanglement uh, pair uh, if both the qubits passes through the same physical process right that is a mini, that is a requirement for producing an entanglement pair for that you need uh, physical connectivity but if certain qubits are not connected then you you need to use a swap gate you need to move a swap gate and uh, once the qubit is free you can again just move the qubit back to this position so that it is connected to uh, the intended uh, qubit right so compiler can uh, introduce uh, these kind of swap operations which basically is an overhead because each operation each swap operation consists of three c not uh, kind of operations now after this compiler optimization what what actually is our instruction set if we compare it with the classical uh, um, uh, computation our instruction is a pulse okay so uh, like our assembly uh, mnemonics which we used to have in our classical computation we have this pulse program as our instructions because physically um, i'm i'm not giving you a physical uh, uh, realization how a qpu is made out i can give but uh, in in uh, such a small time it's not possible there are various qubit technologies for this qpu right you may have heard of so it's an i iron trapped uh, uh, topological and um, uh, semiconducting or quantum dots or photonics uh, almost a dozen uh, qubit technologies exist but almost in all the technologies we need to use a pulse as an instruction so either it could be a photonic pulse or it could be a microwave pulse okay so you made your program and that uh, pulse is thrown to the qpu and qpu you know is consist of many qubits so each qubit in itself is a two state quantum mechanical system and this qpu may be having uh, 433 433 qubits like uh, we currently have on ibm quantum right and uh, so after throwing this logic on the qpu um, the whole computation need to be done in uh, some um, 20 microsecond but now the coherence time has increased so it is coming up to few seconds right so in the in few seconds you need to complete this computation and come out so there is a read out again to the classical uh, computer back and to me it looks like uh, the method of uh, uh, giving the task to a qpu is just similar to as we do in gpu okay now about this uh, pulse that uh, this instruction which is a pulse it is of the utmost important that the pulse width and shape of these pulses which are going to through this uh, through our program logic on the qpu need to be perfect if there is a non perfection in this these pulses um, uh, there would be gate level errors okay this introducing as a gate level errors because as i said that any operation quantum gate operation on a qubit is a rotation of of that vector right so if the rotation would not be perfect because of the uh, not a perfect pulse shape um, it will introduce gate level errors and then we just make make a read out uh, on the classical uh, computer 
Now, how to write a quantum program? So I have just broken that quantum program into four uh, uh, stages. So the particular system starts with the classical state and the classical state. So like in, in IBM system, you just start all the qubits into cat zero state, right? And then the first thing you do is you put your your uh, qubits into superposition state that we easily can do by applying a Hadamard operation. I hope it is visible. So you apply a Hadamard operation and put that qubit into equal superposition. Now the next thing you do is that um, while acting on this superposition, you introduce an interference also. So you need interference because uh, somehow you make you want to make this program that the resultant uh, probability of your answer is too high, right? Um, so there would be probability uh, spread of all the possible answers, but uh, the correct answer should have the highest probability. So there there must be some source of interference which cancels out the wrong answers, right? So for that, we introduce interference also, and I will show you how to introduce that interference. And then the last operation is you do a measurement. So you do a measurement on, let's say, this qubit Q0 and uh, Q1. So this is the operation measurement operation being shown here. And uh, when you measure it, it is going to give you a classical output, okay? So this, this, this is a very over uh, simplified view of a, a quantum program I've given you. Now let's go through uh, what is a uh, quantum parallelism and uh, how we introduce superposition into that. So let's just, uh, so there is a uh, function, let's say, which is which takes binary input and gives binary output. Now the task is that you need to find out whether this function is a balanced one or a constant one. We are calling this, uh, we call it that Doish algorithm. This is the very first algorithm which define, which gives gives us an impression that what is the quantum parallelism and what can be achieved out of that. So how, how classically we do that is that we give input zero and we evaluate this function. So the output could be a zero or one and then on the other hand, we do a second operation also where we pass a, a F0, uh, uh, where we give a zero, it is giving you as a one, uh, one. And then later on uh, uh, for this function, when we are given zero here, we will give a one also here, right? Now, a balanced one, uh, a constant function is one that if you give a zero, it is going to give you a zero. If, it, if you give it as a one, a one, it is going to give you a one right so that is a constant function that the input is uh, the output is constant with the kind of uh, input you have given now let's say with the help of quantum gates we make a unitary uh, unitary uh, operation which uh, gives us uh, the output if we have given a input as uh, cat 0 plus cat 1 by root 2 and uh, the input, uh, the second qubit is cat zero, then uh, we call it x, x in, input x and input y, right? So the operation, uh, the function which we need to evaluate is fx. On the second qubit, we are going to get a y uh, xor with fx, okay? So this kind of unitary we can easily made out of the, the uh, gates we have talked about. So this, uh, so the input state of the system would be input uh, the cat x and cat y, but the output would be cat x uh, and uh, y xor with the function fx. Okay. Now, if we introduce a superposition, now how we introduce a superposition is that instead of a cat zero or one, we have equal superposition of the qubit, which is cat zero plus cat one divided by under root two. So what would be the final state of the system? Because the final state, final output is y xor with fx. So we have, uh, we, we inputted what? Zero, cat zero plus cat one divided by under root two. And uh, uh, what we are going to get is, uh, either it would be, the, either the, out, uh, the, uh, the output would be uh, zero and uh, fx, uh, so corresponding to zero input because it is it's a superposition, right? We need to evaluate both cat zero and cat one. So if we well we say that it the input 
is cat zero. For cat zero, the function value would be f zero, right? And if for one, the function value would be f one, right? So if you see that uh, at this output, at this output, we are evaluating this function for both zero and one at the same time. Okay, so this is uh, the um, the value of superposition because we have introduced the input as a superposition like zero and one both at the same time. We are able to evaluate at the output this function for both the inputs. Okay. Now let's go to the Deutsch algorithm. What actually it does? So. Just be patient because uh, this is quite uh, getting mathematical now. Um, so let's say we have input X, right? And I'm now introducing the interference also. So we have seen what is the effect of superposition. The effect of superposition was that we are we were able to evaluate the value of uh, the function FX for both the input zero and one at the same time. But uh, <clears throat> Here, if you see, uh, we are now introducing the interference also with the superposition. So, how do we inter uh, introduce interferences that you have cat one? If you pass this cat one to Hadamard gate, it is going to give you uh, cat zero plus uh, minus cat one by root two. So, the state here, psi naught. Uh, okay, the state psi naught here. Uh, no, state one here would be after applying this uh, Hadamard gate, the state psi one would be the tensor product between the state uh, cat x and the output of the Hadamard gate corresponding to the uh, cat one. So if we give a cat one to a Hadamard gate, we are getting uh, the cat zero minus cat one divided by root two. So this is the state of the complete system at this point of time. Okay. The next thing is that uh, if we apply, uh, we evaluate the state after at the output end. So if we evaluate the psi, uh, state uh, psi two at this point of time, what we have is that cat, cat, the first qubit cat uh, x would remain same. At the output, what we have is cat zero uh, exhort with fx minus cat one exhort with fx divided by root two which we can again write as uh, x cat x and cat 0 minus 1 divided by root 2. So if we evaluate fx to be 0, right? If fx is 0, then, then this uh, portion is not going to exist, right? The only thing we will have is 0 exhort um, um, with 0 divided by root 2. Right, so we can write this in this form that cat x, uh, cat x uh, uh, into uh, cat zero minus uh, cat one divided by root two, and uh, we can represent this uh, in this form that uh, there would be a negative one, which has a power of f x, with uh, and uh, the the rest of the things are same the two qubits the first one is x the second was one is the um, output of the hadamard gate right so what we essentially are having here is that this function uh, that, that this uh, phase sign minus one is being uh, dependent on what is the value of fx here now we are represented here uh, the value x, right? For the simplicity, uh, sake of simplicity, I just introduce it like x, but uh, obviously to get a correct answer, we need to introduce uh, superposition here. So superposition is introduced with a cat zero uh, input uh, to a Hadamard gate. So now I'm, so we were at this state psi two represented as this in the last slide. Now we just expand this cat x also. So we, if we expand this cat x, and uh, multiply it with the uh, minus one to the power of fx. This is this would be something like this. OK. Now what we see is if f is constant, right? Constant means if you give it a one, it is the output is also a one. So let's just uh, 
assume that it is a constant. So F0 value is 1, right? And F1 value would also be uh, uh, 1, right? So we have a minus 1. So this, this, this expression is going to become as a minus 1. So minus 1 with cat 0 plus minus 1 with cat 1. So we can just take out minus 1. So we always would have cat 0 and plus cat 1 cat 0 plus cat 1 like this. So cat 0 plus cat 1, cat 0 plus cat 1. So in case this function is constant, we are go going to get cat 0 plus cat 1. If it is a balanced one, we are going to get a minus here. OK, because uh, let's say you have one here uh, as an output. Yeah, and then obviously if it is, if it is not a uh, constant one, you will have an opposite value zero here. So in that case, there would be a negative sign appearing here. So ultimately what we uh, what we have, ultimately we have the output stage here. Right and uh, this Hadamard gate denotes what this Hadamard gate denotes that uh, the input which was X need to be converted back to the input and we usually do that after every operation that the state of the input qubits were uh, 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 given the their, their same same status back right so this hadamard gate if you apply to the this output which is this at present this is going to give you a cat zero and if you if the value appearing at this point of time in this uh, at the output of the first qubit here is cat 0 minus cat 1 by root 2, it is going to give, uh, give you a cat 1 after applying this Hadamard gate. Now, in a nutshell, the, the, the only thing we need to uh, evaluate is this bit, right? After Hadamard gate, if you just evaluate this bit, whether it is cat 0 or cat 1, you are going to get whether the, fun the function is balanced or constant. So by just one operation of this unitary gate, which we have made, we are getting the function evaluated, right? In the classical um, methodology, if you see, we have evaluated the function, the same function f two times, okay? So you pass a zero to the uh, to f first, and then you pass a one to in, in the second pass then only you are able to say that the function is balanced and constant. But if you use the principle of quantum communication using the superposition and interference, what you need to do is ultimately in the end that you are measuring this uh, qubit at this uh, output of this uh, Hadamard gate. And if it is zero, you are saying the function is a constant one. Otherwise, uh, if you are get, getting a cat, it's a balanced one. So this is a small algorithm which shows that uh, how uh, uh, how uh, quantum uh, parallelism works for us, and it is uh, much advantageous way. Now, this is a quantum program I was about to show, but uh, in the paucity of time, I am not going to operate uh, to do that. Uh, I am moving to quantum compilation and optimization. So I've sh shown you that uh, how you submit your quantum job, right? But then but there, there are many considerations this quantum compiler need to have. And wh what are those uh, considerations? So the circuit depth, qubit connectivity, noise error, and uh, gate level errors that uh, it need to consider. And uh, this, uh, I'm showing a good and bad compiler behavior. So if you see, this is a bad compiler behavior, and this is a good compilation. Why this is a bad compilation? Because the use of two, two input gates here. There are many two input gates. You can see many C nodes are there because C nodes, two, two uh, qubit input gates are having higher uh, noise uh, levels than as compared to the single qubit gates. So this is a bad compilation result and this is a good compilation result. So you can see that in the good compilation, the probability of uh, your answer. So this is how a quantum out computation output looks like. It is always in terms of probability. So all possible uh, bit strings you can see down uh, on the horizontal lane, and these are the pro corresponding probabilities of uh, happening for those output. 
right so in a good compilation if you see that there is a 56 uh, percent probability of getting this correct answer and there is much lesser lesser noise as compared to this uh, bad compilation result uh, we have a lot of noise a higher level as compared to the actual result right and the probability of actual result is also very less okay. now the other uh, yeah so this is a qubit connectivity constraint so as i said that uh, for C0 operations, basically you need uh, two bits to be connected. So this is a uh, IBM quantum uh, five qubit quant uh, quantum processor. This is Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5. So these are superconducting qubits, right? And there is a connectivity between Q3 and Q4. If you see, if, you, if it is visible to you, we have a uh, carbon resonator, resonator uh, B1 and B2. So this connectivity is giving you the um, confidence that uh, if you want to do a C0 operation between qubit 2 and uh, qubit 0, qubit 3 and q4, it is possible. But for other qubit, it's not possible. So this gives us a concept of logical and physical qubits, right? So let's say this is the circuit I want to make out. I have input qubits as uh, qubits which I want to operate. And this is the C0 uh, gate I want to apply, right? But then because of connectivity, you need to choose which qubit to, uh, which uh, logical qubit you need to uh, map to a physical qubit. So that mapping uh, is also very important. And uh, I think com modern compiler, quantum compilers are taking care of that. So it is like, Classically, we have instruction set architecture, right? And the CPU architecture, right? Um, and our compilers um, for that architecture take care of that. So in a similar fashion, here compiler takes care of the mapping between logical and uh, physical qubits. Now comes, uh, I was talking about noise and gate level error. So as you can see, you can just compare, uh, this is again that same uh, quantum uh, processor, five qubit quantum processor. And this shows you the connectivity between different qubits. Now, if you can see that C0 error rate is uh, on an average 1.7, but uh, a Hadamard gate has an error of 0.7. So it is again signifying that the two qubit uh, gates have a much higher level of uh, uh, gate errors. Now, with this, uh, uh, now, the, what is the source of all this noise I'm mentioning here? So you one thing is gate errors. And uh, how gate error happens is that if you are not giving a proper shaped uh, pulse as an instruction, then it introduces a gate error. But there are other aspects of uh, decoherence also. So we have T1 and T2 type of decoherences. T1 is a uh, uh, T1 uh, decoherence is something that uh, if you uh, because qubit is a two level system, zero and one. So there is a high energy excitation when you go from zero to one, right? So at after some time, qubit tend to uh, decohere, right? And it's a nature of physics that everything tend to go to the lower energy, right? Whether it is a classical or quantum physics. So this is the time um, of uh, uh, decaying a qubit from state zero to one. And then you have T2. T2 is something that you put, you use a Hadamard gate, you have, you have put your qubit into superposition, but it will not remain into superposition for quite long, right? It again decohers to some of the uh, zero state, uh, zero or one, right? And then we have a readout error also. Readout error means that uh, uh, as you do quantum operation through uh, microwave or photonic pulses, readout operation also is a uh, pulse operation and uh, this quantum computer uh, co this qpu quantum computer is not a closed system because obviously you need to interact uh, to throw the pulse you need to interact uh, uh, with the outer world so readout errors are introduced because of that interaction so these are the, are the noises we have so just a quick time check manish if uh, it is allowed. Uh, I can go through this slide. This is going to take some time. Officially, you have only three minutes. <laughs> OK, I'll just 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 explain that. OK, so we have the concept of logical and uh, and uh, physical qubits I've just introduced, right? But then, as, as I said, that because of noise, we can have errors. 
right just in classical uh, just as in classical system we have bit flip errors we have bit flip and phase flip errors here right and to overcome the errors what we need to do is that we call one qubit as a physical qubit but then we need some helper qubits these are called ancilla qubits and which which helps us to detect and correct the error at the um, on the fly when the computation is going on so if you see this uh, mesh kind of structure uh, there are some data qubits d0 d1 d2 d3 in the white right and there are some points uh, which are red and green so these red and greens are nothing but these are ancilla qubits so these are helper qubits you are not going to use it in your program uh, as logical qubits okay now uh, how uh, to do an error correction so an error correction is nothing new to us the concept which i am going to discuss is just classical concept so i am going to introduce the repetition uh, error code so what a repetition error code is classically that if let's say you are in a noisy environment and you are ordering pizza and you want somebody ask you you want uh, 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 a pineapple on your pizza on the topping right so when the environment is noisy you don't say yes you say yes 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 yes, yes right and you assume that uh, the other person must be hearing you maybe it is a, a, a let's say you 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 say I said yes uh, 10 times he would hear five or six times so majority of time if some person listens yes then it was assumed okay uh, he is saying yes, right? So th this is called repetition code. So redundancy of information you introduce. Now, how do we do that? That let's say we are transmitting a zero or one, and uh, so so this is uh, these are three qubits, right? We we just want to have one logical qubit uh, as zero value, but then because we are we want to repeat, we have three three values of zeros here. But let's say while doing the operation because of noise, this uh, third bit gets flipped, right? So with this third bit get flipped, we are going to uh, detect that and uh, correct that, and then we re reintroduce it. Because we are doing uh, calculation um, on the fly, this, uh, need, this correction need to be done multiple times, and we need to always do, do a check, right? But the problem is, uh, at this point of time, when you have measured, you you identified that okay, there is a bit flip error. But in quantum computing, you cannot measure that. As soon as you measure that bit, the the state of that qubit is going to collapse. So you don't you are not uh, able to do that calculation again. So how to do that? To do that, you have uh, something called syndrome measurement, and this is the, this is a small circuit. I will just mention. So how do you do that? Do that? that uh, for an example that I'm transmitting this repetition code of zeros and there is an error there there is some noise because of which few bits get uh, uh, flipped to values of one right so I'm not going to measure which qubit gets uh, flipped what my logic is that I start with this single qubit and I just see through this uh, syndrome measurement whether there is a change in the bit value or not from zero it is giving me one okay so from one to one okay same same then it says there is a difference from one it is going to zero then same 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 then it is going identifying a change right now after calculating uh, the, uh, so after doing this you uh, you just take the majority okay how many uh, of these bits were of the same type, right? They do, you don't know zero or one, but you know uh, how many bits are in majority of the same time. Then you just uh, infer that uh, the value obviously would be one here, right? And how do we do that? That there is a zero um, uh, as in input, and there is a, another zero at the input. Now you have this qubit as ancilla, as I explained in this mesh. This is a helper qubit, right? And you have a C naught operation here. Now, if you do a C naught operation here, it is control bit is zero. After this control bit, it is not going to affect it, right? Because it is a zero. If it would have been a one, this uh, zero value would have been flipped to one. So this zero will remain zero. It will come here at this point, and then you see another C naught gate. 
Now this C naught gate is being controlled by this qubit zero. So again, it is C zero. So zero would not make any difference here. This output of zero is again going to give you a zero. So here you have zero. But you see the case where you have a bit flip. So this zero was flipped to one. How it will be detected? Same operation you are going to do that from uh, the control bit is zero. There is would not be any effect on this zero. So here you will have a zero. And uh, because this bit is flipped, this has a this control bit value is a one. You are going to get a bit flip here. So instead of uh, uh, so here uh, you have a zero, but this will be now inverted to a one. Now you see uh, that there is a uh, and you can measure the ancillary qubits, right? This is not your data bit. So you can just measure it. So you have measured a zero here, but you have measured a one here. So you know that there is a change. OK, one signifies that there is a change. So this is how you detect an error and then correct it also. So you detected that there is a uh, one appearing here. So there is a bit flip. It's not a majority and you do you do a not operation to get a zero, right? So this is how uh, error error uh, correction code works. And there are many other uh, uh, like shores code or uh, surface codes and many research is going on to get a uh, complete universal uh, quantum computer without a noise. So this is the last slide I'm presenting that there are various forms of quantum computing and uh, all are going in parallel. So we have universal gate based computing where which I have just introduced. So you have this is gate based, but you have a quantum annealing concept also. So quantum annealing is just like saying that uh, with the transistors, which are classical transistors, which I've shown you, if you build an analog circuit with those uh, classical, uh, I mean, those transistors, what you are going to get is um, a, a, a large circuit out of those analog uh, transistors just to solve one specific problem, right? So that kind of uh, computation is also prevalent nowadays, and it is uh, more important nowadays because people are interesting, interested in solving the optimization kind of problems over these uh, quantum annealers. And the simulation of the quantum annealers is called digital uh, annealing. So these, so these are three kind of uh, computations are happening. Now, universal gate-based computing, you have uh, uh, many algorithms to work. So these are the variational quantum eigen solver, quantum uh, op uh, optimization algorithms, QML and QBO kind of problems can be solved using the universal gate based uh, quantum computing. And uh, I've listed this IBM Cascade, Amazon Bracket, and all these are the cloud platform which are offering you these kind of uh, qubit services. OK, so I'm just uh, giving you this slide uh, snapshot so that you can just uh, take a look. And this is a comparison of uh, quantum computing computer architecture with respect to the classical. So you can just go through this that later in the recording. So and um, thank you.